Hey there, Eli here to talk about a build that hangs out with bosses and uber bosses like their old pals. Now I'm gonna say this up front, this build isn't cheap and it's not a league starter, but it's also not unattainably expensive. And while it's not the absolute fastest mapper I've ever played, maybe you want a build that doesn't die while mapping if you get up suddenly. Maybe your kid needs to show you something right now, maybe you want to be watching a movie on your second monitor while leveling up. Or maybe you just want to completely disrespect nearly all endgame content in high tier mapping and think this looks enjoyable. If any of those fit you, you should stick around for a bit. Now we're going to talk about gear and passives and the straightforward crafting that you'll do for this build. But first I want to double down and talk about gameplay to make sure you really want this. To take care of regular packs of mobs, we throw out an unearth, which spawns a line of corpses, and then hit cremation to create a geyser that blows up those corpses and all of the monsters in that pack. For a normal pack of mobs, one unearth, one geyser is enough to delete them. And when you really want to rain hate on something, we're going to hit unearth and then do two cremations if we can, do another unearth and then a third cremation because that's the max we can have, and then we just spam unearth. Just hold down the button. Our geysers will take care of the rest. The geysers, which come from cremation, last for about 8 seconds, so as we're deleting a target, we can just intermittently recast cremation while we're spamming the unearth. And because we're progressively gaining more and more cast speed thanks to corpse pact while we do this, it becomes easier and easier to slip in cremations as we spam unearth with higher and higher cast speed. And as you can see, things die, including this 70% less damage taken uber cortex. In terms of dealing damage, that's it. Otherwise, we're shield charging around, flame dashing whenever we want, we auto cast flame ability, and we manually cast punishment on bosses that deserve that level of destruction. Let's take a look at why the defensive layers are so damn strong, and let's start with the less obvious ones. Incandescent Heart and Aegis Aurora give us a ton of base armor. Then our granite and basalt flasks compound on that to feed our determination aura, giving us around 47,000 armor. Aegis Aurora is going to convert 2% of that, 940 into energy shield whenever we block. So we've got an ass load of physical damage reduction and a significant amount of ES on block recovered. Speaking of block, you know, the best defensive layer since dodge was shanked and left in an alley to die. This character hits the cap on both block and spell block thanks primarily to being a necromancer. We're picking up 31% block and spell block from our bone offering which is always going to be active since we're shitting out corpses all the time with unearth. And because our weapon triggers socketed spells when we do anything, socketed spells that include bone offering, we don't have to think about getting our 31%, we just get it. Aegis gives us another 32%, and for the rest of our physical block, the Red Nightmare and Shield Mastery gives us our missing 12% to cap us at 75. Put another way, we use this shield, we're a necromancer, we socket a jewel, and take a mastery. Boom. Max physical block. For spell block, we use Divergent Tempest Shield, which is getting a quality boost from Ashes of the Stars to give us 30%, to bring us up to 61. Then we take two convenient notables, Mystic Bulwark and Arcane Guarding, to give us another 16% and cap us out at 75. Remember how we're getting 940 energy shield whenever we block any hit? Does that seem strong? You don't know the half of it yet. Let's use the last piece of our hard mitigation, our elemental resists, as a segue into our soft mitigation like leech and regen. We're using melding of the flesh to set our max resist number based on one resist in particular. We're going to pick cold because Aegis has plus 5 max cold res built right into it. So we're going to do everything we can to pump that back up from the minus 4 we get from melding. As long as Purity of Ice hits level 23, we'll get plus 5 max from that, which gets amplified into plus 7 from our increased aura effect. Our gauntlets give us plus 2, and we're grabbing our last plus 3 from the tree via an impossible escape jewel. So from our new base of 71, we're gaining plus 5, plus 7, plus 2, and plus 3 back, giving us 88 maximum resists from 2 jewels, an aura, and some eldritch currency thrown at our gloves. Finally, Incandescent Heart takes 25% of the elemental damage we receive and converts it into chaos damage, which, yep, we're immune to. So whenever we get hit by elemental damage, only 25% of the hits actually get through our block, and then only 75% of that damage is dealt, which is then reduced by 88% resistance. God damn, that's good! As for Leech and Regen, we've got 551 Energy Shield Leech and 480 Regen. So for hitting stuff and standing in our Consecrated Ground, which we usually are, we're gaining 1031 Energy Shield per second. Should we TLDR this? Okay, this build is capped block and spell block with 88% all res, immunity to chaos with 25% of elemental damage transferred to chaos, gaining 940 Energy Shield on block, and is generally regenerating over 1000 Energy Shield per second. 
So long as we're sitting in our frost shield, which we should be whenever possible, this is what our effective hit points are. So next I was thinking, what's that? You want to talk about damage? All right, I guess we can do that. This right here is Uber Cortex with 70% less damage taken. Here's plain Uber Eater. I'm gonna come clean with you. I'm not 100% sure what our true damage is because it ramps up over time. When I try to normalize path of building to calculate it properly, giving cremation a 1.0 cast speed and removing the less damage from GMP as it wouldn't affect the corpses being detonated, it tells me we're at 14.5 million. 24 million once they hit low life with punishment. But then I go back and look at 70% less damage cortex and our Uber Eater damage, and I wonder, is that number accurate? Maybe, I don't know. Regardless of all that, whatever the true DPS number is, this build is highly disrespectful to nearly all of the game's upper end content and is an excellent boss farmer. The more monsters or projectiles or attacks hitting it, the more chances it gets to restore nearly 20% of its energy shield on block. Truly the biggest downside of the build is that it's a two button build. There's no getting around it. Unearth doesn't do anything by itself and neither does cremation. One needs the other, so you've gotta accept that going into it. But we shield charge pretty fast and we've got flame dash, so we're a little bit on the zippy side with that. And man, I gotta say, it feels good face tanking Uber Eater and completely ignoring any content that throws progressively more creatures at you. The more the better for this build. All right, before we finish this up, there's a couple easy crafts I wanna to talk to you about. First, we'll do the sample of the gloves because they're the more difficult craft, potentially. The scepter is really straightforward. I'd barely consider it a craft. So to show you how you do this, we're gonna create a new item here. We're gonna go to our gloves and get some int gloves, some wool gloves, because they're gonna be item level two. Now we're picking item level two because at this item level, the chances of success skyrocket. By going this route, we're giving up a potentially higher energy shield base and losing the possibility of getting a resist as our third suffix or an attribute or some other modifier. If you take a look at the POB, we are using item level two gloves. It's really not that bad. We want them for the plus five, not for anything else. So we'll select item level two and proceed. Now what we're gonna do here is we're gonna go to our fossil craft and we're gonna do corroded, dense, faceted, and pristine. And we'll toss this on here. What we're looking for is plus one strength and plus one dex gems. So we'll hit it again, strength int. Okay, we got plus all three. And that's fine because really what we wanna do here is fill up our suffix slots. And by the way, doing that all three times probably cost us around 200 chaos, not too terrible. So now we'll go down to our crafted section and we'll scroll down and we'll say suffixes cannot be changed. Scroll down again, hit plus, that's two divines. Then we'll go up to our veiled chaos orb and we'll hit that and unveil. And we missed it this time. So we're gonna select this. And then we'd recraft. Suffixes cannot be changed. Hit with our Veiled Chaos Orb again. Unveil. Plus two to level of socketed AoE gems. That's one of the two we want. We would also take plus two to projectile gems. Select that. Then we'll scroll up until we find plus to level of socketed projectile gems. Add that. And we're done. Now to finish this off, we're gonna go ahead and get our plus two max cold resist. We're gonna go up here to our Eldritch Crafts. And I'd recommend using Grand Eldritch Embers because the Grands usually hover around somewhere like six to seven chaos each. And the exceptionals are like 70 chaos, maybe a little bit more, 75, 80 chaos. And so we're gonna hit this until we get plus one max cold. There we go, plus one max cold. This is obviously a bit luck dependent, so it kind of is what it is. And we're gonna toss on a random grand icker. Great, we don't really care about that at this point. And so now we're gonna hit this with an orb of conflict. And we're gonna hope the Searing Exarch implicit goes down to tier three, which it did. So now the Searing Exarch mod, the plus one max cold resist, is as if we hit it with an exceptional ember, which comes from the Searing Exarch. So now we hit it with another orb of conflict. And if we hit plus two maximum cold resist, we're done, we did it. Then we just throw on Grand Ickers until we get that mod right there. That was convenient. Now the gloves are done. However, let's go back here to our Orb of Conflict stage. Now what if we hit Orb of Conflict and we go back a tier to tier five? Well, now we have a question to ask ourselves. If for example, an Orb of Conflict is 70 chaos and the Grand Ember is six chaos, then we essentially have 12 rolls of Grand Embers to go back to our tier four before it becomes more cost effective to use Orbs of Conflict to try to get back. So that's a question you have to ask yourself. You know, we can try it right now. We'll go back to our Grand Embers. One, two, three, 
4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. As you can see, we're kind of going and going. It's possible, it is possible, that this is the wrong move. So if we undo all these, it's possible that we can instead roll the 50-50 and go back up a tier. Then we can roll 50-50 again, go back up a tier, go down a tier, go down, up, up, up. So for some of you going through this example isn't necessary. You're pretty familiar with cost effectiveness for comparing the Ember tiers and Orbs of Conflict against market value. But the general rule would be use Grand Embers as they're relatively cheap. This will get you to tier four. And once you do that, hit it with an Orb of Conflict, hope you go to tier three, hit it again, hope you get tier two. If you dropped a tier five on your cold resist off of your Orb of Conflict, it's probably worth using another Orb of Conflict on it to try to get back to tier four. As you saw, you can roll a lot of Grand Embers before you get back to that tier four cold resist. And while it kind of hurts using 70 chaos or so a pop on the Orbs of Conflict, if you can get back from tier five to tier four using that, it's probably in your favor. Now, if you drop to tier six, then it's time to go back to the Grand Embers to roll back into your tier four cold resist. All right, now for the Scepter, let's head over to Craft Exile Emulator, create a new item, go to our one-hand weapons, go to our Scepters, click a Void Scepter down here for 40% increased LE damage, and we'll just assume it's eye level 100. First thing we wanna do is buy one of these Scepters with plus one to all physical spell or just all spell skill gems, and we want that to be fractured. Let me go ahead and make this a rare because we'll need to be rare. And what we'll do here is we will go to our essences, find our essence of fear, which is minions deal percent increased damage. And these essences are usually pretty cheap, so we can go ahead and just kind of roll these on here. And what we're looking for are some nice suffixes that'll help us out. Resistance, fire damage. I like to take a high level resistance here just because it helps fix that up, eases the tension and weight on some of the other rare pieces. For the purposes of this example, we'll just leave that tier four resist, that's fine. And then we'll go down to our bench under our suffixes here, trigger a socketed spell, craft that on. That's why we need at least one suffix modifier slot open. And then the scepter is done. Really all we need is the guaranteed mod for minion damage, fractured plus one all physical or all spell skill gems. Ideally some kind of resist that helps us fix our maximum resistances and this trigger craft. In perhaps a perfect world, we get a tier one resist and tier one and tier one percent increased fire damage, but it's not necessary. The resist is going to be the most useful thing in terms of gearing out the rest of the character. And as for gearing out the rest of our character here, the rest of the rares and uniques aren't exactly complicated or super rare. They just might be a little bit expensive. It is important to get the increased bone offering on our boots. And we do devote one of our rings to stat fixing and cursing with flammability on hit. How you mix and match these rings and your belt in terms of the exact resistance numbers is kind of up to you and what you have access to. It is worth noting that we use the Watcher's Eye to get immunity to freeze, and we are picking up Vile Bastion thanks to Forbidden Flesh and Flame Jewels. So, like I said, fairly straightforward in terms of the other gear that you need, just not exactly cheap in all cases. And that's going to be it on this absolute monstrosity of a tank. If you've played this build or you're thinking about playing the build and you're currently in the process of it, go ahead and drop a comment. Let me know how your experience has been because I'd love to see what everyone else is doing with this build. And be sure to check the video description for some important links. That's going to be it for now. So this is Eli signing off.